Ingram. We are here with Rachel Platten. So I want to know, who is in charge of finding a troop of people who could dance on bicycles for that? First of all, this is so awkward to have next to me. <laughs> you don't like sitting next to pictures of yourself? Just like really just in the moment in here. <laughs> um, who was in charge of bicycles? Yes. Who, Picking the who bicycles? Could who could find people who could do these dances and these acrobatic moves? Oh my gosh. I couldn't believe who they found. Yeah. I had the idea of a bike gang, but I had no idea they were going to find people who could stand <laughs> yeah. on their head on bikes. Yeah. <laughs> that was like extra. <laughs> the amount of knowledge that music video directors have and where to go find these things. It's pretty is incredible. Yeah. I think my label found them. Um, they were Russian. They're called artistic cyclists. Okay. They're incredible. What a thing. So talented. They're world champions. What a thing. Yeah. Um, so Broken Glass is obviously part of Waves, which is now out. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. The album has been out for, I mean, three and a half days, I guess, at this point. What does it feel like when it's something that really was a very personal sort of culling and journalism and all these like sort of like digging into your emotions, getting it out in the world? Are there nerves and then you're so relieved when people are responding positively to it? Or how does it work? Yeah, it's cool, first of all, that I came into the office and told you so much deep stuff yeah. like bef before this a very deep yeah. chat, you guys. we really did I was like really open that day I don't know why um no but it's it, that, I, I mean it that's cool that you actually know that side of it now I forgot the question <laughs> I guess just what is the reward then when oh. people hear it and also respond positively I mean you're getting wonderful reactions on social media from your fans people are really sort of appreciating these messages yeah that's really amazing I really believed in this music. I, I think, I hope I can say this without sounding like cocky, but I, I kind of, I believed so much in the songs that I knew that they would get a good response. I felt like they would get a good response. And I, or maybe it wasn't even that. Maybe it was just that I was so proud of them that I reached this place of like, well, I did my job. I did the best that I could. I made music that I believe in, that's honest, that that I meant. And, and I reached this point of, I guess it, it doesn't really matter, although, of course, I'm insecure and care. The deeper part of me was kind of like, hey, it doesn't really matter how people respond. It's my art, and I'm proud of it. What does it mean? I mean, you've put out records independently before you had a label. This is your second one is on a major phone? That sounds like Stranger Things. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, bah! <laughs> I was so scared. I watched so much Stranger Things last night. Did you guys? Yeah. <laughs> that slug thing is horrifying. Okay. <laughs> It's okay. Sorry, Madison. No, you're fine. You're fine. Okay. Um, but I, so I was just wondering, you know. Madison you can... and I are drinking. That's the problem. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Rachel. Sorry. <laughs> it's my problem. It's okay. It's okay. Okay. It's right. Balvini, though. It's really good. Yeah, it is good. Um, to go back to the album just a little bit. Okay. Um, what does it mean to sort of be at this point in your career, having put out music this long, writing the songs this long, to know that you're sort of achieving your dream artistic vision at this point to be so proud of a collection? Hmm. That's really special. Mm -hmm. I wish I had a better word than special. Okay. That's, it's really fulfilling. It's awesome. It feels really, really good. And then you have this deep sense of peace that's like, okay, whatever happens from here, I really did everything I could for this project right now. You know, the other thing is recently I've reached this point of understanding that helped me be a little less nervous about releasing art into the world, which is scary. I realized that I am a creator. I'm going to create the rest of my life. I'm going to write songs. Maybe it'll turn into something else. Maybe I'll write a book or maybe I'll write a musical. I don't know. But I'm going to keep creating. And this is a stamp on time, but it's not the, the last thing I'm doing. Even though I'm obsessed with this and I love it, I don't have to feel so, put so much pressure on this one project because I can't, it's like, I'm not going to stop producing art. Right. Right. That's true. It's a great outlook on it. Um, yeah. So many of these songs, I mean, from listening to the music, you hear there's a lot of angst or insecurity and anxiety. And then there's obviously a lot of uplift and a lot of importance. And what I've been reading in you know, your mentions and your conversations with your fans, and so many of them are coming to you saying, I've had that same moment at three in the morning, you know, crying in my bed. I've had that same sort of fear. What has been the most touching reaction or one that really like sort of hit you kind of in the gut? Hmm. I, a lot of people have responded to a song that I wrote called Hands, which is about my grandma, and it almost didn't make the record. It was It's just deeply personal, and I I kind of just felt like maybe it was just for me to heal because my grandmother had passed away two months before I wrote the song, and I was like, 
going to the studio and I just wanted to write a song about her that day. And I didn't think that it was for the public. I kind of just thought it was for me and my family. So at the last minute, my manager insisted. He was like, I think this is really special. I think we should put this on. And that's been shocking to me that people have responded to that one. And I've gotten a lot of messages from people being like, thank you, this is reminding me of my grandparent or my mom or my dad or someone who's passed away. And I guess that's really surprising to me. I, I guess what's strange is that art can be so personal, but then when you reach a really universal, honest place, it becomes universal. Sure. Sure. That makes so it transcends yeah. my personal experience with my grandmother and it yeah. becomes something for anyone who's loved anyone or felt loved by someone. Yeah, that's awesome. We got to talk about sort of the bizarre, creative, weird makings of this record. Mm -hmm. Animal onesies, weird piano tricks, all of the <laughs> sort of bizarre inspiration that you guys went to. Maybe you can just tell some of us here, like going back to those studio sessions and that kind of like bizarre environment, where were you guys channeling that from? Why did you know that you needed to do something different and all mm. of that? I don't think I knew that I needed to do anything different. I think I just allowed myself, I was just having fun. I just didn't really feel like there were any rules, and I don't know why I got to that place. I think I felt more confident in who I was. I think I owned this record a lot more. On Wildfire, which is my last record, I was on the road the whole time, and I left it in my manager and my producer's hands, and I was really not involved in the actual production. I mean, I wrote every single song there, but I didn't get to choose the sounds that were blanketing the you songs. You chose some bizarre ones on this one. It and works, this it's one, awesome, yeah. I wanted to be in control of that. It was really important to me that I was the, the main voice, that I was dictating what I wanted to hear, what these songs that I was writing felt like and sounded like. And I kind of had an, held it in arm's length, my manager and my A&R and my label. And I was like, let me create and then you can come in. And I think that that allowed me to have more fun because it was just me like deciding one day, yeah, let's play around. Who I don't need to show this to anyone. It could suck. Right. Like, it's fine. If, if, like, changing the sounds on the piano strings, whatever, that might be the worst idea ever. <laughs> but I'm going to try it. Sure. Yeah. What was the biggest challenge, or what song was, like, the hardest to just nail and get right and figure out the right mix for? Oh, that's a good question. Um, hmm. They were, you know what's so strange? They were all kind of easy to get the right yeah. sound for. Perfect for you. Help me help me with some night old titles here. Grace was easy. Labels was hard. Labels was hard. Good one. That was really hard. Okay. That was one that I tried to micromanage wrongly. I was working with Ryan Tedder on that one, and he's brilliant. I'm a really big fan. And my manager, Ben, and I heard what he sent over after I after I uh, wrote the song with him and our first instinct was like no we don't like the change that you made because it was a lot more there was no drums in it and it was like really like pretty it sounded a little bit more like issues vibes before it was really like synth and kind of floaty and ethereal and then he added like some toughness to it and those the chorus now has this um synth bass that's like right. kind of sounds like an anchor and we were like oh it's what is that it's terrible and we resisted, and he did so many versions, and he was so patient. And then finally, right before the record was due, he um, told me, he's like, can I be honest with you? I felt like you you guys kind of hijacked the song. And I and I and can I show you what I really think the song should sound like? Yeah. And, I, and I was just so busy with other productions that I was like, yeah, send it over. Send what you think. And it was so good. And it was the right. second thing he sent over. Right. <laughs> so that was tough. And I sh that was a good lesson that I'm not always right. right. I like that. Um, you also worked with Busby, Ian Kirkpatrick, um, Stargate, a lot of collaborators. What do you look for in a person to get in the studio with? What works? Or are you looking for energy or resume? Or how does it kind of all mismatch? Great questions. <laughs> um, I, th I think it's a really big mix of the two of them. When when So what happens usually with a co-writing session is my manager or publisher will present to me um, the person that they want me to write with that day. And then... I'll usually, if I haven't heard of them, if it's not someone with a big name, I'll ask, yeah, what have they done? Maybe I'll look on their Wikipedia page and see what have they written with. Um, and so that will be like the first way of getting through into the studio with me. Right. It's very tough. I'm just kidding. <laughs> and then once we have a session together, it is all about energy. Yeah. I don't really care what the resume is. If I felt like there was someone there that made me feel safe artistically and encouraged me, then I would write with them even if we didn't write a good song that sure. day.
I would just want that person around more because they were bringing out the best in me. And really all that matters is not the talent of the other person. It's how that person brings out your talent. Right. Because I could give a perform a, an amazing performance that day in the studio and I, it wouldn't matter if anyone else contributed anything other than energy and, and me believing in myself. Or I could be with the best people in the world and not feel confident, and it wouldn't matter. I wouldn't get a song. I wouldn't get a song that mattered. That's awesome. Um, there was a moment where you played Grace for me before this record came out, and I've just been sort of waiting for it to come out into the world. Thanks. Um, that's sort of crowdsourced in a way with all of the background prayers being the chanter. Yeah. Can you tell us about how you guys got yeah, this together? Yeah, I haven't told anyone this. Good okay, call. Okay, great. Okay. <laughs> um, so on this song, Grace, there's a lot of whispering. You love it. Oh, I'm so glad. There's a lot of whispering little voices that you guys hear, and they're actually prayers that we had people send in from all over the world in all different languages. Um, all different ages and races and cultures, and it was so cool. It was um, this idea at the very end that the song is special. There's something deeply healing and resonant about it, and we said, well, maybe we should, I'm really spiritual, and we were like, maybe we should get people to pray over it. Like, not a certain religion, just like anyone, just get, get them to pray over it. And then my manager was like, why don't we get them to actually send in prayers and we'll make it this weird, bizarre kind of like throughout the song so that when you listen to the song, you're getting infused with love from around the world. So that was the intention. Did you always know once that was completed that that needed to be sort of the final note of the album, have it at the end? Yes. Yeah. I always felt like, and I actually wanted it to be eight minutes long <laughs> and I wanted that ending to extend. <laughs> and everyone's like, Rachel, relax. We're not going that weird. Because do you guys know when there used to be albums that had songs that were like so long and you could just listen to them and fall asleep to them or like vibe out to them? I love that. And I wanted it to be almost a meditation where you could lie down and like listen to it in the end with just these weird sounds and like of just love and you know you're just floating in that feeling and but they made it only four minutes so that's fine it's that could be on the extended <laughs> yeah <laughs> oh my god um there's something else you did different during this recording process you deleted all social media apps from your phone yeah why was it important for that not to be in the studio with you because it was messing me up i was so distracted i was so focused on uh that that i was losing followers that i was like my perception, what it was looking like to the outside world. And it was really weird what I did. I took a year off from really touring besides private events here and there. I just didn't go on the road. And artists don't do that these days. And I did it because I really wanted to create from a place of uh, not distracted, not I don't know. I just wanted to be present. I wanted, I wanted it to be my version of going to a cabin in the woods and shutting out everyone else. But social media... I have a really, I have a hard time with it. I just, I just kind of hate it, honestly. <laughs> I do. I, I love that I get to connect with fans. That's special to me. But I hate the idea of me constantly thinking like, oh, how do I look? How many likes do I have? What are people saying? It's so, it's so exhausting. Isn't it exhausting? Yeah. Can you imagine life without that, of just like living your life and not looking at what people thought of your life? Yeah. I, I wish I could leave this revolution. <laughs> I've like visited social media places today, sorry. <laughs> As you've come back to social media, you've done it in a sort of different way. You've been launching these initiatives, you know, big upping other women who are like making waves and doing all these cool things. Was it important to you to come back to Instagram or Twitter with like a different relationship and approach to it? Yeah, I wanted to be more honest. Like I wanted to, I, I don't know, I wanted to kind of let the mask down a little bit and show what I'm really feeling and who I really am and not just show a pretty picture of me, but like maybe also show moments where I'm not feeling great about myself. But that's really confusing because I tried to do one where I was crying and it actually was crying. I was really sad and I, I don't remember what I was feeling insecure and I was on a plane and I posted a picture of me crying and I was honest about what I was feeling. And then I literally got like 10 phone calls from people that are close to me being like, are you okay? Right. My manager was freaked out. My publisher was freaked out. My mom was, oh, my God, losing her shit. And, <laughs> and I was like, okay, back to regularly scheduled programming. Here's a selfie. I look skinny. Hi. <laughs> so I don't know what the answer is, honestly. I, I don't have one for you. I wish I did. I don't know. I'll, I'll, maybe in the question, you guys tell me. <laughs> um, we do see some water, obviously, here, and that's been a lot in all the imagery with all of your press photos for this. Tell me about the title, Waves. There's obviously not a song that's actually called Waves. No, there, there, there is a song called Waves. It didn't make the record. Okay. 
<laughs> yeah, it was also called called The Art of Letting Go, and it okay. it didn't make the record, but it might make another... I can't say any more about it, but... Okay. Um, I live right near the beach, and earlier in the writing process, I was going to the ocean, like, once a week and swimming, and I'd swim before sessions, maybe twice a week. I'd do yoga and then jump in the ocean or just work out on the beach and jump in the ocean or just take my dog down to the beach, and it was just really healing for me. I don't know. I think pe different people are attracted to, like, different elements. Like, some people love mountains, and, and in L.A., we always compare like whether you live on the east side or west side and east side people really need forests and mountains around them and west side people need the ocean and I just I don't know I need the ocean and that's a terrible explanation I don't know what <laughs> I also waves are um I, I my psychologist was like I have this amazing psychologist who's like works with a lot of artists and does performance psychology about anxiety and like you know, being comfortable with the creative process and how you get out of your own way. And he told me, um, our emotions are like waves. You know, they're just, they come and go. And, and your job is to be steady and let yourself go high and let yourself go low and, and not get too swayed and not be upset about the fact that you're low when you're low or high when you're high. Just like kind of let it go. So that was this whole process of letting myself be high if I was high and letting myself be low and, and, surrendering to it all and writing it all. Right. Right. I love that. Um, that was better than the that was good. one. <laughs> we'll keep both. Um, <laughs> obviously, a lot of people know you for anthems like Fight Song. You know, we've gotten a lot of pump up empowerment. And on this one, it was more of like a 360 degree view sort of, you know, of womanhood. Um, is it important to you to have a message and an actual conversation in your music and to sort of put it out into the world with like a very defined point of view? Hmm. I don't know if, if it is or not. I don't know, honestly. Sometimes broken glass was, it was, a, I felt like as a human, that was my need to respond to what was going on this year. It was just so messed up. And I was just responding like emotionally. That was the best way I knew how. But the rest of the songs weren't me trying to spread a message as much as, I don't know, just me being in the moment and letting whatever I was feeling be okay yeah. and I wasn't too conscious of what I was spreading to the world as much as I was conscious of like letting myself feel what I was feeling and heal through writing which is often how I work through something whether it's good or bad if if it's like there and like you know when some feelings like bubbling up and it's taking over your whole body and like that's it even if it's a good thing and you're just obsessed with it uh, to get it through me, I have to write a song about it. <laughs> so how many songs are you generally, like, sort of churning out that we don't see? Like, are you constantly writing? Yes. I wrote a song, a terrible song, this weekend. <laughs> I was partying in a onesie yeah. again. And, <laughs> um, I'm, yeah, I'm writing all the time. I, melodies are, they're, like, I feel like songs are, like, floating around my head. And if I am open to it, then they'll come through. And if I'm not then they'll go to some other artist. <laughs> what, <laughs> what sort of place do you have to get in to sort of hear them, I guess? Like, do you need to be yeah. relaxed? Do you need to set aside time alone? Or how does it kind of work creatively? I definitely don't need to be alone. Sometimes I will be in a conversation with a friend and they'll be telling something, tell me something really vulnerable and I'll be like, I don't want to take your idea, but hold on. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I did it to a friend this year right. with, with a song called Loose Ends. Okay. So it's really... It's really angry. Have you guys heard that song? It's there's just like a lot of anger in it, and I I didn't know who it was about. I was like, who am I so pissed at? This is crazy. And then I realized, oh hi Clarissa. Clarissa will like the story. So Clarissa's friend had had a breakup recently, and Clarissa was telling me about her friend on the phone, and it was breaking both of our hearts because we're both super empaths and we were feeling for her deeply and this guy was a dick and he like he was treating her badly and we knew he was going to come back and it was going to be too late and we were like Ugh. you know for her we are feeling that for her and that was right what I what I talked about right before I got to the studio and the song was about her and I didn't realize it and then this is incredible and then she was playing the song for her friends later on the demo and her friend was like that's so weird that feels like my life and Clarissa's is like, uh oh. Oh no. oh no. And I'm like, oh my god, it is her life. <laughs> oh my god, I wrote a song about her life. <laughs> oh my god, I love that. Do you call her at that point and just be like, thanks? 
I didn't. I should. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. I'm sorry that you had to go through that, but thank you for the song. <laughs> and I predicted it right. Yeah. A jerk did come back and say exactly what we thought he would. I hope song. you keep us updated throughout this whole press Don't tour. Don't worry. She didn't. She did. She she didn't take him back. Okay. Good. Good. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for me. We're gonna take a couple from the oh, no. audience. I know. Sorry. <laughs> There's one back here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Hi. How you doing? I'm great. Uh, uh, what I would like to know, what was the creative process behind Fight Song? It was very instrumental in my life, and uh, I would oh. like to know the uh, story, the process, or the secret sauce that uh, made it come about. Thank you. The secret sauce, you're so cute. <laughs> well, I wrote it in a lot of stages. I wrote it a lot in this area, walking around New York City in the village, and um, I wrote it over a period of a year and a half, and I tried so many different versions. Um, I tried with, with four different producers and finally no one could get it right. Is this the kind of stuff you want to know? Or like, okay. Um, no one could get it right. And so I went to Guitar Center on 14th and I was like, found like the most eager, dorky looking guy that I could. And he, I was like, do you want to teach? I, that's not true. Actually, he, he was kind of hot. <laughs> I think I found the cutest guy. Don't tell us. <laughs> and I was like, do you want to teach me um, Logic? And, and he was, because Logic I had known a little bit about. You guys know what Logic is. It's a music production platform. Okay. So he came over and taught me over the course of six months. And finally, I knew how to produce it myself. And so I got that drum part right. And once I got those drums right, I could write the verse. Because it was like this thing that I couldn't unlock. Are you a producer or a writer at all? No, okay. Well, I don't know. With with production, sometimes it's essential to the songwriting because if you aren't hearing the song um, put in the right packaging, you can't finish it. So no one could give me what I was asking for. So finally, I took control of it and produced what I wanted, and then I unlocked how the song should be written. Then I brought it to John Levine, who was the producer, showed him the demo. And that um, a lot of the sounds on the demo are the same as they are in the final version, except we took the bridge and made it the first verse. I had a different first verse before. That was his idea. It was brilliant. That's awesome. Here? Oh, me. Okay. Um, oh, should I stand? Okay. So, Good for um, you. <laughs> so uh, I've been a huge fan for years. When I saw you on your wildfire, wild, I can't speak. Wildfire. Wildfire tour. <laughs> tour. Um, you said word. that when you stood in front of Irving Plaza and you saw your name on the marquee, you mm. felt like it was an amazing feeling of your life. I was wondering how your experiences um, touring for that album and also writing songs from the album, like Lonely Planet, how it inspired some of your songs on your new album. That's a good question. You know, I've recently said that, I don't know if you have a physical copy of the album yet, but in it, there's a little message that starts the whole album, and it says, I don't know why these songs were so easy to write. Not that I didn't have to battle with them or work hard, but they didn't, they weren't a struggle. I wasn't like fighting myself to write them. And I think it was because of all of the work I put in over the past 12 years learning to write songs. I wrote like 500 songs before Fight Song came, but even more than that before that, maybe th maybe 1,000, maybe 1,500, and then Fight Song came. Um, and in that process, I was learning how to write a pop song, and I was learning how to be honest in songwriting, and I was learning how to um, share vulnerability. And I think that all of that went into making waves, and it was why I dove so easily into the writing process and why I like instantly felt, I know how to do this. You know, this is, this is easy, this is fun. But also, Lonely Planet, that you mentioned that one, I, it was such a mistake that I didn't put it on the album. I'm so sad, and it's not really anywhere online now either, is it? On the deluxe edition, yeah. It sucks. It's one of my favorite songs to play live, and I don't. it was a really dumb choice that we didn't put it on the record. I think we all got like, we got this feeling last minute of like, oh, we need more singles, so which is such a stupid, dangerous thing for an album, and we kicked it off. So I'm glad that you mentioned that one. That sucks. I mean, but it's great. I don't know. <laughs> There's one right back here. Yeah. Hey, Rachel, I just wanted to ask, um, how do you take a concept and translate it into your lyrics? I'm a huge fan of just how honest this whole album has been. Thank you. It has been honest, shit. Um, <sighs> how do I take a concept and turn it into lyrics? Oh, I okay. It comes in a it comes in so many different ways, but I would say the most 
usual, usual, whatever, normal thing that happens is that I flood. I like just emotionally flood the page. I'll just write out freehand, like I'm writing in a journal, everything that I feel about that thing. And I won't worry about it being lyrics or not. But often what happens is because I'm a songwriter, because I've written so many, is that halfway through that journal writing process, they'll come out in little chunks like little poems. And like things will sound artistic. Or there'll be metaphors. And, and then I'll, I'll weed that and look through it for gold. And I'll like mine it and see if there's anything good there. And even if there's not, I've really then gotten to the core of what I feel about that feeling. And once that's kind of my answer is just getting everything I feel completely honestly onto the page and not worrying about if it sounds like a song lyric or not. That's great. Then over here. Hi. Hi. So you are a part of I Am That Girl Foundation. Yeah. And um, I read something really cool that you guys do at your meetings, which are like AA meetings. And you say, I'm badass because. Yeah. Um, why do you think that in real world, it's so easy to appeal to the vulnerable side, even of your music and yourself, but when women see each other be confident and kind of like doing things, it's a lot harder to kind of get that girl power and support from everyone on a bigger scale. And what do you think we can do to change that? Okay, just so I completely get your question, because I feel like it's really layered and great. You're saying when, when we're acting more confidently, it's harder to get support? Or it seems like sometimes it's harder to get recognition and support, and there could be like jealousy or competition. Got it. So why? Got you it. You mentioned that as well in your interview. So why yeah, I think that I think that we like hearing that our egos, like the smaller part of us, like hearing other people struggle, right? It like feeds this like sick satisfaction that we want. Do you guys know what Eckhart Tolle is? Sorry, I'm getting super deep. He wrote this book called The Power of Now. You should all read it. And he says that there's this sick satisfaction we get when we hear someone else's misery. We relate to it. It's like this lower, you know, frequency in us that's like, oh, that's good. I feel that too. Okay, but then, but that's not, that's not who we really are. Who we really are, are is the person that when we see something kind done by a stranger to someone else, when that lights us up and then we want to go do that more, when we want to spread love and like do random acts of kindness, that's really who we are. And I think that because of social media and because of the way the, I don't know, I don't know what it is. We just, we haven't been encouraged to be that version of ourselves enough. And so seeing another woman act confidently threatens us and makes us feel like less, which is ridiculous. Because really what it should do is inspire us. But I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Like I'll see a friend of mine succeed and I'll be like, oh, that means that I can't succeed, which is so silly. Like you hear that in me and you're like, that's silly. Of course she can succeed too. There's, there's room enough for everyone to succeed. Just because Taylor Swift is going to dominate with an album in two weeks doesn't mean my album can't also live and have success and recognition. But we get afraid that that will happen. So... I think the answer is in talking like this, is in sharing and recognizing these moments like, oh my God, me too. Because once you say that, once like you hear me say that to you, I feel this way and you're probably looking at me in this like gold shiny outfit like, oh my God, why would she feel that way? But I do because I'm human. I think it allows you to feel better about the fact that you also feel jealous and insecure and then also can hear that that's not really who you are it's not really who I am who we all really are is the person that roots for one another that wants to lift each other up that is inspired by other people's success that gets excited when someone that we love succeeds that's who we really are <laughs> yeah yeah and then we have one Ooh, more I question know what I said. <laughs> hey Hey, Rachel. Um, Hi. When making the new album, did the melodies come first or the lyrics came first? Usually the concept came first. So his question about a concept, I was listening to a podcast, for instance, and the podcast was about wholeheartedness and living with your whole heart and being a wholehearted person and what that meant. And it was an hour and I was driving up to Tarzana in California and I loved it, I loved, this, I loved the idea. So then whole heart, I was like, that's, that's a concept. That's a brilliant concept. What is it gonna be about for me? Cause it's not gonna be about this Buddhist idea of like wholeheartedness. What's the everyday thing that I can say? Oh, that I want to see someone's whole heart. So I'd say the concept, but then the melodies come and then the lyrics come. Can she ask a question? Yeah. Is that fine? Yeah. Here you go, babes. Thank you. 
Hi. Hi, Rachel. I love you. Okay. Uh, aren't you glad she asked a question? She's so cute. Okay. So who inspires you to continue making music and not give up? Hmm. Who really inspires far? me to keep making music and not give up? Yeah. You know, so many people, my husband, Kevin, my manager, Ben, my amazing team, my assistant Katie, my friend Clarissa, my sister Melanie, my, and then, but really it's me. It's me. It's this wise, strong, wholehearted person inside of me that will never give up, that just will always keep trying when I'm knocked down. I love you too. <laughs> you guys waved this out now, Rachel. Thank you so much for being Thank here. Thank you guys so much. I love you all. I appreciate it. Thanks, Madison.